Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Real Talk. It's Lucas here, and I hope that today's episode informs and inspires you to have your own real conversations. As always, today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at Trivan, maker of trucks, trailers, and enclosure buildings tailored to your needs. Be sure to check them out at trivan.com. A huge thanks to them for sponsoring the show and making it possible. One other quick note before we get into today's episode is that if you are willing and able, if you could leave a review, preferably a five-star one, on any of the podcast networks or platforms that allow for it, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, that will be much appreciated as it helps get the word out there and lets people know what we're all about. So with that in mind, on to the episode. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Real Talk. Uh, today we are joined by Reverend William Den Hollander. Um, very privileged to have him on with us. Um, we're going to be talking about um, another mark of the, the true church. I know I did a was trying to do a series on this. Um, didn't quite, you know, come together in a series. Something like a series, like a visiting minister, where you kind of get bits and pieces of it. Um, so this is church discipline, uh, which is a mark of the true church. Um, and often something that's not really talked about all that much and probably something that's a bit difficult to talk about or not really, you know, popular in our culture right now. So um, mm -hmm. we're excited to have uh, Reverend William Denhonor on to to teach us a little bit about our church and about uh, um, church discipline and how, you know, what the biblical model is. Um, so, yeah, why don't I uh, let you get uh, let you introduce yourself a little bit and what you've done. Um, where you've preached. I know you've been all over the world, so. Yes, yes. Um, I will keep it short. There's a need to, a lot to be told, but <laughs> there's a need. I am Reverend William Den Hollander, but lately we have to add the senior to it because there's another William Den Hollander who is a professor at our seminary, That's which it. is our son. So I am the senior. I have been retired for 11 years. Uh, my last congregation was uh, Toronto. Before that, I served the church at Dunville, uh, or uh, the church at Orangeville, and the church in Winnipeg. And lately, you know, I've been interim pastor in the church of Dunville, URC. I've actually served a lot of uh, vacant churches during my uh, retirement. I served the church of uh, Dunville, URC in 2013 and 14. I've been in the Hamilton URC for a full year, full time. The Attercliffe uh, KenRC, also the uh, Ancaster KenRC. So my 11 years of uh, retirement show that you know it's kind of semi-retirement. Yes, but it's a wonderful thing to do. I've also been enjoying very much uh, the National Board of Arthur Canada as part of my retirement, and I've been in the board of uh, the Christian Counseling Center for six years, uh, all sorts of activities that perhaps in active ministry you don't get around to too much, but uh, particularly, you know, the uh, service in the URC has been very close to my heart. Uh, during my active ministry, I've been in the committee for uh, contact with the URC for lots of, for many years. And so the URC is very close to my heart and to be serving now for almost three years in the until you are see is a real ple uh, pleasure, a real privilege. Wow. Well, that's what I'm doing. That's what I have been doing. I see. That's not exactly retirement. I don't think you can call oh, that. I know. You need a new word for that. I, I explain <laughs> to people retirement, you know, the root word is tire. So you get new tires and you're good for another 65,000 miles. <laughs> and that's what I've been doing. Just Lots driving. People think the root word is tired. I know, but uh, <laughs> I haven't been tired yet. <laughs> I have indeed also been all over the world. You know, we served uh, a kind of an interim ministry, a, a stint in Australia three times, in South Africa one time, and in New Zealand one time for three, four months. And those oh. are very, very special experiences during my retirement as well. Wow. So that keeps you fresh and that keeps you energetic, that keeps you going. And <laughs> this is another opportunity that uh, I cherish very much. Yeah. Well, we appreciate this. This is. Uh... It sounds like you were busier in the 11 years after your retirement than before, but I'm sure there was plenty before, too. Oh, precisely. Yeah, it was. <laughs> the Lord has been very gracious, and, and I've been richly blessed. Well, we appreciate you spending the time with us, because 
church discipline is is one of those topics I've been thinking about talking about for a long time, and I think it's probably timely, especially with our culture, probably with our moment in the church as well, um, mm-hmm. to understand like why what is church discipline? Why do we value church discipline? And as a mark of the true church, it's also a key of the kingdom of heaven, as described mm-hmm. in our in our catechism. So yes. it's obviously very relevant. And I don't think we necessarily put the time into it, uh, to even to just to understand um, what it is to our church and then how it's so important. So hopefully we can dive into that and offer sure. a little bit of clarity. Yeah, look, like you say, it's uh, definitely a very relevant topic in this time and age. Uh, we are living in a time in which people are not easily admonished, where people are called to repentance but don't really know what that means or they don't really know what they have to repent from uh, what repentance basically entails so when the gospel is preached and it should be responded to with faith and repentance you know then that's really the challenge that we are facing today that people will indeed be strengthened in their faith perhaps but to follow it up in the sense of Repentance, that is really, uh, yeah, rare, or that is really not very common. So right. that's really where church discipline begins. It's, it's you know, the response to the preaching. And when we speak about discipline, then we speak about not only church discipline, but also self-discipline and mutual discipline. And those right. three are, are indeed very interwoven, you know, if you don't know what self-discipline is or you don't practice self-discipline, then it is understandable that if someone admonishes you and calls you to repentance, or if the church, the elders, call you to repentance and you're not used to repenting upon your own self-examination, then, yeah, then there is a problem. Hmm. So, yeah, discipline. To me, in my catechism teaching, I always uh, linked it to the word discipling. Because basically, that's what it is. You know, there is the concept of shepherding the flock, but there is also the concept of discipling the flock. So people need to become more and more disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in order for them to be more competent and adequate disciples of Christ, they need to repent from their sins. They need to be renewed in the image of Christ. They need to be filled Mm. with the Spirit of Christ in order to become more Christ-like. And and to get there, you need to repent from whatever is in your nature that is not Christ-like. Right. So, yeah, that lays a good groundwork for for discussion, I guess. One question that comes to mind right away is why do we need, as as church members, um, the model described by by Jesus in uh, as a as a shepherd of a flock um these kind of these metaphors um yeah. or how elders are to lead a congregation um mm-hmm. why is that a, ne- a necessity because at the end of the day we're we're not necessarily saved based on something an elder does we're saved based on our faith in Christ so yeah. why is why is church discipline really a necessity in that we have leaders who are watching over our souls. Why is yeah. it? Why is it not just? Well, be in this, be in this group, be in this club called the church, and at the end of the day, the cards are going to fall where they do. I certainly would not call the church a club or a group. <laughs> uh, it's the body of Christ. It's you know the body of Christ of which He is the head, mm-hmm. and as the uh, image denotes, you know the head directs the body all the members of the body, you know, but when you speak about being saved, then that is too often limited to, let's say, go to heaven when you die, or it's limited to receiving the forgiveness of sins, and then you can be at ease, you can be at peace. But salvation contains a lot more than that, contains not only the forgiveness of sins, it also uh, implies the renewal of our life. And that is part of our salvation as well. Christ saved us from our sins, and those sins pertain to the way we think and the way we respond, the way we feel, the way we act, the way we 
work or whatever. Our whole life needs to be saved here and now already, and not just when we die and go to heaven. So our whole life is in the picture. That's why, for instance, you know, preaching as well as church discipline are the keys of the kingdom. Okay? When when the word is being proclaimed on Sunday, then that is proclaimed in order that it be applied during the week. And the kingdom of Christ comes to show be shown in the world. It will be seen in the life of the members. But that's really why it is so important to understand the word salvation properly. Christ saves us from our sins in in a comprehensive way, in an all-encompassing way. And therefore, you know, we need the preaching to show us the way of the kingdom, the life in the kingdom, the new life in Christ. We also need the elders to shepherd the flock and show them uh, wherever they are still struggling or wherever they are still uh, living in sin or wherever they have not understood what the new life in Christ entails. So the key is, what do you mean by salvation? Christ is a savior of our whole life. And therefore, by faith, we are saved regarding our whole life. So the preaching indeed strengthens us in faith, but it also calls us to repentance with regard to whatever, let's say, the, the, the sermon was about and whatever the sermon showed in application to our daily life. Right. And yeah, that makes sense. So it's it's not just about reaching salvation, reaching, you know, salvation at the end of our life. No. It's about Today. living salvation out from day to day and you can't really do that if you're just muddying about yourself like that that exactly. discipline needs to kind of keep the church but individuals too on the right path exactly that's why self discipline is so essential as well which is your personal response to the preaching and, and that yeah. pertains to something different every week because the sermon is about this aspect of life or that aspect of life and then you see let's say the assembly as being the town hall meeting of the kingdom citizens. So they come there together. That's why the church is called Ecclesia. Right? Believers are called out of the world, put together in the church of Jesus Christ, in order that they go out into the world and show themselves citizens of the kingdom. Right? You seek the things that are above. You seek the things that are with Christ. And that right. needs to be that needs to be articulated and explained and also applied, first of all, in your personal life, in your personal repentance, but then also in the life as the, the communion of saints. You have to help each other in that way. That's why you have societies in which you discuss the scriptures and apply it that way. That's why you you get a home visit of an elder, and they come to shepherd you in regards to the pastures of righteousness which is the pastures of obedience, of love, of, of our life. Right. So is, is church discipline um, much different than that shepherding? Like, is that just the, we, I mean, we, we talk about church discipline kind of like proper, as in like the, the excommunication thing. That's what we think about when we say that, yeah. I guess. But <laughs> I guess you're, you're using the word shepherding as, mm -hmm. that's, that's almost like a precursor to? No. No, to me that is like that's why the I same, also the same. use the word discipling, discipline, mm. discipling. You know, it's, and discipling, as you know, uh, yeah, that is a form of discipline. If you are disciplined at home by your parents, okay, then yeah, you sometimes are admonished by your parents, or you are admonished by one of your siblings when they know something about you that is not proper, that is not sinful, that is not holy, that is not uh, allowed, or then, then you are admonished. So you also hold on to each other on the way of salvation, on the right track of obedience. So right. discipling, shepherding, discipline, you know, putting it that way, it becomes more positive than mm -hmm. what you imply by saying excommunication that sounds so threatening that has a negative connotation. Right, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so maybe let's unpack 
the the terms uh, keys of the kingdom and the marks of the true church. So maybe the marks of the true church first. I think the keys of the kingdom has a a bunch to it. Is why is it important that the church discipline is a mark of the true church? Like, is I understand the so shepherding and and discipling a congregation in the way they should go is important. Mm-hmm. Why is the church not a true church without that? You know, when I taught catechism still, then I summarized those marks of the true church in this way. The word of God has to be heard and seen and felt. So it has to be heard by way of the preaching of the gospel that has to be faithful and truthful. It has to be seen in the proper way of celebrating uh, the Lord's Supper and Holy Baptism, and then it also has to be felt. We have to feel it in our lives that we have to repent. We have to cut into our own flesh. Okay? We have to repent from sinful practices. We have to turn away from evil. Uh, so discipline has to be felt, and that is indeed a mark of the true church, because by the preaching and the celebration of the Lord's Supper and discipline, the church distinguishes itself from the world. And in order to remain distinct and holy, which is a better word, in order to retain that holiness, yeah, we also have to watch over the holiness of the congregation. Now, just as every individual member of the church has to heed the admonition of Peter, God is holy, you have to be holy. And that applies to the congregation, has to be holy, has to be distinct, has to be set apart from the world. And then if someone is living a worldly way or practicing a worldly practice, then that affects the holiness of the person, not only, but also of the congregation. So the church needs to remain holy, including the the preaching, the sacraments, but also church discipline. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's well explained. I think that's uh, yeah to keep the church holy. To yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, okay, so I, I understand that. Like, it it's it's definitely key to. Um, and if, if you kind of if you lose church discipline, it's it, you definitely lose something in in the holiness of the congregation and and in the truthfulness, I guess. Like, and that is you know in a way a threat to the congregation because you would evoke the wrath of God over the congregation if you would not discipline people that are living in sin. You know, mm. I'm, I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians, 5, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul speaks about a, a situation in the congregation where someone has a, a wife or a concubine, supposedly, you know, who may be his uh, stepmother or who may be, well, a very sinful relationship. And nothing was done about it. They just condoned it. And then Paul also shows very clearly the seriousness of the situation, because it is evoking the wrath of God. The same as in 1 Corinthians 11, where we speak about the celebration of the Lord's Supper, and people do not examine themselves, and they eat and drink judgment to themselves. Then Paul says, too, that's why there are so many people in the congregation who are sick, who are dying, who are uh, suffering, you know, and that is the wrath of God on the congregation, mm. because it does not retain the holiness of of the church right yeah it's not a very popular thing to talk about i guess we'll talk about that a little later like it's not it's seen as as accepting and tolerating tolerating not to you know to talk about these things so i guess we're not so different than the corinthians in that way that's true you know and and especially since let's say practicing it is not popular either Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it kind of loses its uh, its effect. It loses its seriousness. It loses its character. Uh, and then, right. of course, the church is in danger of losing that mark of the true church. Right. Yeah. So, how is well? Let's talk about the the keys of the kingdom then. So, maybe you could describe the keys of the kingdom. It's it's described well yeah. in our in our catechism, um, yes. but I don't know that we always think about. The keys of the kingdom, especially well, I mean, preaching is the key to the kingdom, and 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 church discipline. So, what what is what does that mean, really? And what and then how is how is discipline part of that? 
Well, first of all, the keys of the kingdom is the preaching of the gospel and the exercise of discipline. So the preaching of the gospel as key of the kingdom means that the preaching should prepare the members of the congregation for their life in the kingdom of God. That's their focus. You know, this world is occupied by the evil one. Just like in the Second World War, Germany occupied Holland and Belgium and France and Poland and what have you. So this world is occupied by the devil. And now Christ is going to take that back. And he does that by way of the preaching of the gospel, changing people from worldly people, uh, evil people, uh, inclined to all evil, to people that believe, that people that serve Christ again. So citizens of the kingdom. Mm. So that's what the preaching does as the key of the kingdom to make people kingdom citizens. That's why the Lord Jesus also pray, uh, taught us to pray, your kingdom come. So in that petition as well, okay, we pray that we may show that more and more clearly and more and more uh, vividly that we are kingdom citizens. So then as a result, if people are not living that way, as members of the church are living still in sinful practices, let's say are still serving idols, a particular idol, or are, ser- are being part of psychics, or they go to uh, to the casino, you know, they're, they're coveting, you know, which is idolatry as well, or people that live in a long relationship then that is a worldly relationship, that is a sinful relationship, which should not be entered into the kingdom of God, or which implies that they are not fully repentant from the worldly way of life. So that's where the discipline comes in. People have to learn to live as kingdom citizens. You learn that through the preaching, but if you don't apply that faithfully, obediently, then you also have to learn it through your fellow members who know about it. Or you have to learn it through the elders who find out about it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. It's it's so how do we understand what, like the key part? So the keys of the kingdom. Okay. Yeah. Is it well like we the, think of a key old, as we talk about opening and closing. Opening right? and closing. Yeah. And that's indeed where it is from, you know, in the old testament. Uh, the book of Isaiah, for instance, chapter 22, speaks about the keys of David. And that is a concept in the Old Testament. David had a palace, and David had a treasury. And, you know, people were admitted to David's palace for advice and counsel. They were also admitted to be supported, to be helped out of trouble. So they got access to the treasury of the king. Now, Christ has the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Christ has the keys of uh, Hades and heaven. And so he opens and closes, and he has entrusted those keys to the apostles at first, and then to the uh, office bearers later on, ministers and elders. So they open the treasury of Christ, forgiveness of sins, the newness of life, the glory of of God. You know, they, they receive all these treasures uh, the, the gifts and talents that are uh, employed in the congregation. Right? Christ, by his spirit, provides all those treasuries. So it is a key to the treasuries of the king. And so the elders or the ministers, they have that key to the treasuries of the kingdom of heaven. And the, the kingdom of heaven means that they already share in all the benefits and blessings of Jesus Christ that he has obtained for us. and. Yeah, the forgiveness of sins and the newness of life by His Spirit, re, uh, renewing us in the image of Christ. So that that's how the key opens the treasuries to all these blessings and benefits of Christ. Right. So will, will we misunderstand the keys of the kingdom if if we think it's uh, salvation, um, a key to salvation? I guess. Like, yeah, well, it's part of salvation. Forgiveness of sins is definitely part of salvation, but also life in the kingdom of God as a new life in Christ is also salvation. It's also 
you know, what the keys of the kingdom are sometimes mistaken for is, you know, that it is only discipline, that it is only excommunication. You know, and in some cases, uh, there is the, the expression uh, that the elders are rattling with the keys of the kingdom. You know, in other words, they are threatening to trouble you or to get you into trouble or to get you uh, excommunicated. You know, but that's, of course, a totally wrong understanding of the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom are very positive in opening the kingdom, in providing the blessings and benefits, in renewing the life of the believers. Uh, that's all positive. And, and then the discipline part is to keep people there so that they won't lose out on all these benefits and blessings. Right. Yeah, it's a hard thing to understand with the... I understand the, the, the positive end of it because it's easy to, to, to understand how to, sh- you know, shepherding the, the preaching and the, the discipline are, are, are helping to shepherd people into a positive relationship um, yeah. with Christ, create a, you know, a, a faithful, fruitful body of Christ yeah. um, it, as a church and then guide everyone towards salvation in him. Yeah. How, it's the negative side that's always the the struggle. So it, it's easier to think, yeah, like what you said, like it's only church discipline because we see the closing. We don't necessarily see the opening right. uh, as like the opening is, is an ongoing activity weekly, I guess. But is the closing is something that we, or at least I more formally like think of as as discipline in that it's, I mean, that's where it's more readily seen it, it but, in, but in you're a, using you're using the word negative for it correct yeah yeah it seems uh-huh. like that's just where my how your brain works with the word closed that's the problem <laughs> i know well of course the closing is a very serious aspect of the use of the keys and when people do not repent when people persist hardening their hearts in sin then again it's not negative to admonish them and to call them to repentance. Rather, you do that by showing them the grace of God. You show it to them, you know, that God is merciful and long-suffering. So it's not as if you clobber them, but it is, you know, that you hold up to them the love of God. I mean, this is how the Scriptures speak about discipline in Hebrews chapter 12, where discipline is for our good. And, And we may not appreciate it, it says there, like we were children at one time, and we were disciplined by our parents. And we thought that, you know, they, they didn't understand it, or they mistreated us, or they were bad, or treated us badly. But no, it was for our good. And later on, you come to realize that, that it was not negative, but it is positive. By the grace of God, with the mercy of God, there is, you know, the love of God, who did not leave us altogether in sin, but he gave his son to call us out of sin. And if someone is then particularly stuck in one particular sin, then calling them out of that or admonishing them for it, or even if they harden their hearts, disciplining them for it, that's positive. That's gracious. Right. It depends, okay. it depends totally on the manner in which ministers, elders deal with the approach to discipline. If that is done in a spiritual way, like Galatians 6, verse 1 and 2, explain that you who are spiritual, you have to admonish your brother or sister in a spiritual manner. If you know yourself to be a sinner by nature, and you admonish others as sinner by nature, then you become very considerate, you become understanding. But at the same time, you tell them, listen, but staying in sin is is condemnation is it's, it's God's wrath. And uh, I, I want to call you, I want to pull you out of the fire, like mm-hmm. Jude calls it. Yeah, right. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I think we're going to talk about, <laughs> I had a question later on about that, but maybe we can just touch on it now. But yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's not, it's not necessarily easy. It's very, it's a very difficult thing when elders have to do the, you know, the negative end of discipline is, is, is to show that in love is, is not always easy. No. I imagine I, I've never been in the situation. So, but as members of the church, how can we like, how do we remind ourselves that 
these men, even though they're sinful, and even if we've seen them in, you know, not their brightest hour, yeah. um, that they're there doing this work in love. And yeah. I mean, there's obviously a scenarios where that's not the case. So how do we, how do we wrestle with that? Like, obviously these men are sinful, but they're, they're put there by God. Yeah. Um, they, they are servants of Christ, you know, and, and hopefully their reputation will be good. Uh, you mm -hmm. may know indeed that they are sinners and you may know them perhaps from an occasion where they did not show themselves as spiritual as they should have shown themselves. So you know that they are sinners, but at the same time, if you are receiving them as servants of Christ, then you know that they are speaking on behalf of Christ, and that it is Christ reaching out to you, that it is his love showing to you. Now, the difficulty, of course, comes in when people who are stuck in a sin don't see it that way. When people are stuck in their natural spirit and not in the spirit of Christ, then you get a confrontation there between Christ and the sinner. And yeah. that's why people would consider it negative. However, you know, even uh, excommunication is called the last remedy. So we are talking here about someone who is sick, someone who is ailing, someone who is failing, and we apply medication, we apply therapy, we apply a remedy. But right. if that does not work, and they persist in their sin, yeah, then even the excommunication as last remedy shows how gracious it is. Because it implies that even though we do excommunicate you and place you outside of the kingdom and deprive you of all the benefits of Christ, which is very serious, it is a remedy with a purpose of healing, of restoration, of uh, readmission. That's our focus. That's our intention. So to me, it is never negative. It's gracious. It's mm. merciful. But it needs to be done in a gracious merciful, understanding way. Right. Yeah, which is obviously hard as 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 weak human right. beings, even the you know, upstanding elders of our churches. So yeah, to that to that point a little bit, I guess. So is that I mean, we're gonna get into this culture thing pretty quick, but right. it, it seems like we're um our culture definitely pushes less discipline. I mean self-discipline, parental discipline Church yeah. discipline is just probably appalling to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but is there is there a danger with that? Um, I mean, the the grace filled approach is, yeah. is obviously biblical, and and mm -hmm. our, I think our whole um, the whole process of our of our church order, uh, the whole excommunication is is mm -hmm. um, is meant to be filled with grace. But is there is there a, a danger in being too slow to this discipline, this like admonishment, and and to be too gracious because we can relate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very good point, and indeed, that's sometimes alleged to the work of the elders that they take too long, that they are too slow in applying discipline. But again, then I need to remind you of the fact that God, the Lord. Our covenant God is also long-suffering, which means that he also took long in bringing the wrath upon the people that they deserved. So it is, again, the spirit that we find in the scriptures, the way the Lord dealt with the people of Israel. You know, that was sometimes 40, 50, 60, 80 years before they finally had their uh, verdict ex executed. And that's in the process of um, excommunication or discipline, you know, admonitions need to be made time and time again. Even our form for the uh, excommunication speaks about after repeated admonition. So and you don't go there, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, but you go there maybe uh, every four or five weeks at the most. And that takes them, you know, half a year before you know it. And and you talk about it in consistency meetings, and, and maybe you finally come to the point of barring them from the table right, to, to show them, listen, you are forfeiting 
the grace of God. You are playing with your salvation if you are stuck in this sin. So, barring from the table is an indication, you know, the communion with God is at stake. The grace of Christ is at stake. His sacrifice mm. might not be for you if you stick your, uh, if you are so stuck and hardened in sin. So that right. is indeed a long process, and that is a good thing. You know, sometimes yeah. it is also because elders are busy. Uh, the, the member himself may be very busy, so it may be hard to make appointments with them. This is this has been my practice. You know, if it is someone who is very stuck in sin, then it might be hard to reach them. Uh, it may sometimes be that they find a message on their phone and don't respond to it, and, and what have you. You know, when people are stuck in a sin. Uh, their spiritual life is certainly not flourishing, and and then the elders take the brunt of it. They they are struggling with it. It's very frustrating sometimes. Mm-hmm. But you keep it up, and even if it takes long, you do what you have to do. And then it may indeed be true that the members in the congregation know that someone is being visited, that someone is under discipline, or someone is far from the table, but then even if they know it, and feel that you should act faster, we have to be responsible for the soul and salvation of that member, and we have to do it as responsibly as possible. And that takes time. Hmm. Yeah, that is a good, it's a good way to think about it. Like, I I hadn't thought about that, the Old Testament, God in the Old Testament to the Israelites. I I mean, it's extremely patient at times. You're like, just Mm -hmm. wipe them out. (laughs) <laughs> Think of Paul, who says that in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, how the Lord was long-suffering with him. Look how Paul had been living and doing towards the church, and the Lord let him go there, you know, blowing his anger. And yet, at a certain point, he puts him on the spot and says, now it's it, and that's enough, and now you're yeah. going to be my servant. Like so the Lord it's not, is long-suffering. Yeah. It's not necessarily a... yeah. I mean, we can think of the keys as, as you know, just turn it quick. I know. <laughs> but yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, yeah no. I guess it's giving the Holy Spirit time to work, giving, I mean, you don't know what's going to touch the person's heart and, no. and change them. So, it's, yeah, that patience and that, uh, that love to, to wait and, and walk mm-hmm. alongside them. Yeah. But actually, that's really helpful. That's, um, that kind of gives a good, yeah, a good idea of, of, how to think about it, but the practice also. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to get back to the keys of the kingdom for, for one second, because there's, there's passages in the Bible that, that come to mind when I think of the keys. Um, so I had written down a couple here. Let me just, let me just read a couple passages. Um, Matthew 16 verse 19. Um, and Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's pretty, um, a pretty common, a pretty common yeah. one to hear. Um, and then John twelve twenty three, sorry twenty twenty three, um, along a similar vein, I think. Um, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Yeah. So these two, these two passages, do they? Do these passages in like to me as a kid always? It almost implies that they have the power to determine whether someone is saved or not. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, it probably w- having this lens of like compassion, discipline, discipleship helps, but do these, pa- do these passages? Um, yeah. Do they, do they have more of that flavor to them or well, is that a know, misunderstanding? It, it's, it's the way indeed these keys function, you know, the opening and closing the, loosening and binding, or the forgiving of sins, you know, those are being proclaimed, first of all, in the preaching every Sunday. Right? The minister has, on behalf of Christ, has the authority to declare that those who believe in him and repent from their sins will be saved. So that is, the let's say, the general message that is going out every Sunday in a faithful church. Uh, but the same, an elder, for instance, who is dealing with a discipline case, is also has also the authority to tell that person on the discipline when, uh, if and when you repent, your sins will be forgiven. 
You know, that's why, for instance, the Lord Jesus illustrated those two passages a lot in his own teaching, in his own preaching, in the way he dealt with the parables. Like he himself, too, told a, a, a woman, hey, go and sin no more. Your sins are forgiven. Hey? And that is only, he would only say that to someone of whom he knows that she knows her sin and knows and comes to Christ for his, his blessing, his salvation. And, you know, that's that's the nature, that's the principle of preaching and of shepherding and of uh, the work of the office bearers in home visits, that they indeed may tell the people who are struggling with a certain sin, uh, that repent, stop that sin, and your sin will be forgiven. But if you are stuck in that sin and you continue and persist in it, then it is not forgiven. Mm. And the same with, yeah, someone who is under discipline and who has been barred from the table, but then comes to realize that he's living in sin and needs to repent, then again, the elder or the minister can tell him, your sins are forgiven. And that is a relief. I, I've been there, I've done that. But I saw the, the great relief of someone who was living in sin and who was resisting admonition, but who came to realize, yeah, I'm just kicking against the pricks. And, you know, I'm trying to resist the Holy Spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit. And I, I'm sorry about that. I, I, I will change my way. And then you can say, beautiful, your sin is forgiven. Forget about it. Move forward. It's over. It's done. Yeah. That's the beautiful thing of, of, yeah, of church discipline. You can open with church discipline, too, when they repent. Right. Yeah, yeah. That is a, that's a beautiful moment, no doubt. That's, yeah. Yeah. So I guess we can read those, Pat. So should we read those passages more? Like, I often read them with an emphasis on you, because Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, whatever you bind. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it's almost as if it's up to them. That's that's how I read it. But is it more well, that's, like, that's the authority is it more, they have? Right. Is it more like that they apply the doctrine though? That it's yeah, this you know what the truth is. So then help everyone to understand and to shepherd them. Yeah. And it's not really their decision so much as that's the reality of the situation and they know it. You know, that's that's the let's say the basic mm -hmm. meaning of the key. And that's the basic meaning of their authority to administer that key. Whenever something was sinful and is repented from, you are no longer bound to that sin. You are loosed from that sin. The sin is forgiven. You have that authority as elder in the midst of a congregation. So it's a principle. And that is applied, of course, in, in various situations with different kind of sins and, and different kinds of peoples. But at the end of the day, the elder comes there on behalf of Christ to seek the salvation of that member. And he may give that salvation, open the kingdom, if that member says, yeah, I realize this is not right, this is not pleasing to God, I, I won't do it anymore, I won't go there anymore, I won't, whatever the sin was. Right. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's, yeah, and then obviously in love, because it's, uh -huh. yeah, it's, uh, it can be, must be extremely difficult uh, when it doesn't go that way, but extremely yeah. well, rewarding is, the other it side. Is, it is definitely, let's say, the most, the more difficult part of the mm -hmm. work of the elders. You know, it's beautiful when you come into families or you deal with people's lives that are very committed, that are very spiritual, that are very, eager to to live for the Lord, to serve the Lord, and what have you, and it's a joy to visit them. But if you're dealing with people that are struggling with pornography or with drinking or with uh, gossip or, or whatever, you know, coveting, whatever, there are so many sins that people could still be uh, receptive to, you know, yeah. and to deal with them or to help them, that's very difficult. Yeah. But yeah. you can, you may do that with the gospel, the glad tiding. It's not a hopeless situation. If you indeed realize that you need to repent, then there is the power of the Holy Spirit to help you in your repentance. So we always have such a beautiful message. That's what I love so much about my work and the work of elders too, 
I always stress that, people, you come with the glad tidings of the gospel. You are not dealing with hopeless people, but you offer the hope of, of Jesus Christ. Right. So, it's beautiful. Yeah, 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 it really is. That's, yeah, it that is powerful. So I got a little bit of clarity on this question. I'm just, maybe maybe we can drill into it more specifically, because I, I think it's, it's worth bringing up at least. Um, so our church order talks about discipline reasonably extensively um i think it's you know part of that probably is that this is how our churches do it and we're we're making sure that this mark of the true church stays stays around so um but in article 66 of our church order um the the nature and purpose of discipline um it says um the consistory shall ensure that it is that discipline it's speaking of discipline that it is used to punish sins and then later, and to remove all offense out of the Church of Christ. So we cu- we t- kind of touched on the remove all the offense out of the Church of Christ as as a positive thing to to make sure that the church stays holy. Yeah. I'm curious about the punish sins part that that's written there because, yeah, I, I like to think about church discipline more positively as well. Like to to think about it as like. It is positive. Yeah, to think about it as discipline and negative and a punishment isn't, I, I don't know, I, maybe not as helpful, but it does say to punish sins. I so know. Well, have you never been punished by your parents? Oh, plenty, plenty. Yeah. Sure. So did you, <laughs> did you appreciate that? Not yeah, at the well, time. After the fact. Yeah. Right? But, but did your parents have to punish you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, big time. Yeah. So, Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked. So there, there is nothing wrong with that expression, punishing sin. You know, it's better that the elders punish you for sin than that God does it. Right. If, yeah. I, if I leave you in your sin, then eventually God will punish you in that sin. So right. the elders are there to prevent that from happening. And right. It's the same if, if, if a, con- a congregation neglects the mark of the of the church and neglects church discipline, it evokes the wrath of God because then sin will start to grow like like weeds in the congregation and it will overgrow the holiness of the congregation. And ultimately, just like we saw in the Old Testament, God will pour his wrath on that congregation. Right. And, yeah. and so punishing sin is an expression that means Sin is very serious, and to be barred from the Lord's Supper as a punishment for sin is very serious. Like when you were a a boy and you had a detention at home or at school, you felt bad. Uh, You felt excommunicated. You felt excluded from the the family communion. That's that's Mm -hmm. that was a punishment to be sent to your room and you didn't get supper. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> a punishment of because of a sin that you committed, and and that's how it is in the church too. If people indeed persist in sin and resist the Holy Spirit and reject the admonition of the office bearers, then that needs to be punished by the steps of discipline. Hmm. Do we understand that well? Then, like, I'm. Yeah. Do we do we as 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 a con- as congregation members like think about what a punishment looks like in the church? Is is it really like? I mean, I don't know if I've seen that many people barred from the table in in my experience. Is that? Do we have a good picture of that in our church or in our in our history that of of what those you know steps look like and like a healthy understanding of that? Well, um, I, I think you know, yeah. The matter of barring someone from the table is not very obvious. You know, sometimes a person like that stays home when there is Lord's Supper, and you don't know why, but uh, he's not there. It sometimes happens, like just recently, we celebrated Lord's Supper in Dunville, URC, and I saw one member about whom I know that the consistency has trouble, has difficulties with. I saw that he did not participate, so I kind of surmised that he is under discipline, that he is barred from the table. But, you know, like, like especially in churches where the Lord's Supper is administered in the pews, it is even harder to see than if it is a congregation like Attercliffe was coming to the table. Because then mm-hmm. it could happen that someone sticks out like a sore thumb 
because he stays in the pew and all the people around him go to the table and it would be right. obvious yeah, so far yeah. from the table that that becomes an obvious example right so do we like yeah it it's almost seems like i mean it might be a cultural thing too but the punishment and the i mean the punishment in order to correct which is yeah i mean like you pointed out with parents it is a loving thing it's not a loving thing in the moment maybe oh. and hence the word punishment but if do we understand it well that it's it's punishment and not like just a humiliating of a of a person like that's the a different maybe that's where our mind goes more often that it's it's yeah, not maybe that that is perhaps a, a connotation that is not common anymore in our culture like the word yeah. punishment almost reminds you of of, of prison of, of being sent to jail or so or but punishment is a very common word in terms of uh discipline you know that's why hebrews 12 verse 4 and following speaks about discipline in a very positive way even though it acknowledges that at the time when it happens it's not very pleasant but the ultimate purpose is for your good so i guess in the church we need to retain that connotation of the word punish it is for your good and, and that needs to be explained or proclaimed when the minister preaches on Hebrews 12, for instance, or on Lord's Day 31, that he has to articulate what that really means in a positive sense, that the kingdom is close to you, that you have no, no, no part in it anymore. Mm. And, and, and show the seriousness of that, and, but also the reason for that, because you are stuck in your sin and you are not renewed in the image of Christ, you are not uh, obedient to the call to repentance. You're mm. not showing your love to God the way He wants you to. Yeah, yeah. I guess it is a preaching thing as well. Yeah, like what you mentioned, it's to understand the seriousness of what's happening, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, I guess it is a challenge as well. Like, I mean, we could probably talk for another three hours about practices of Lord's Supper <laughs> and things like that. Barring from the table and and how yeah. how best to display that punishment. Like if if someone is allowed to stay home and and not join in, do we really, as a congregation, are we able to, you know, help and mutually correct each other when we can't see what's happening? And then you know, so that's that, that's then a process, and that's why the steps of discipline are for the purpose of confining the sin and the sinner. You know, you can find it because it's easier for that particular member to repent and return to participation and to membership than uh, if any, everybody would know it, if everybody would be aware of it. And so the, the steps, of course, increase the involvement of the congregation because the next step is that the congregation is asked to pray for a brother or sister who is living in sin, then already, you know, the congregation is involved, yet without knowing who it is, again, to enable that sinner to come back and nobody will know who it was and, and that he has a bad record. Yeah? But, you know, when it is then mentioned by name in the process towards excommunication, then it becomes a responsibility of the whole congregation to reach out and to call call that person and to speak to him and admonish that person, and that's that's a, a, you know again an example that I could use where I've been in a situation even before I was a pastor that I was in a congregation and someone was uh, you know read off and his name was mentioned and then uh, a couple of weeks later I, I visited that person and I asked him whether he had received many visits from the congregation. And then he said, none. No one had reached out to him. So I went to the consistory at that time, and I told them, you cannot excommunicate this person, because even though you announced his name to the church, he was not even visited by any of the elders. He was not visited by any of the members. I said, the, the, the process of excommunication did not work. And that, you know, that's a serious thing. And I'm talking about 40 years ago. So 
it is something that we need to be very vigilant and alert about. It needs to be done by everyone. We all need to realize how important it is. And that's something that I would stress in a sermon on Lord's Day 31. Yeah, that is, yeah. That, yeah, that's that's a good de- depiction of, of the the process, I guess. So that's actually kind of the next thing on my list to talk about the excommunication and, and the process of it and how we, how we do that and, and the model that we, that we yeah. follow and why that's biblical. But that, I mean, your point exactly there, I was surprised and I was reading through the church order, this, the introductory article 66 and the 67 is consistory's involvement describes mm-hmm. that. It says consistory shall not deal with any matter pertaining to purity or doctrine or piety of life that is reported to, to it. And I was like, wow, that's interesting. And it, it follows by, unless it has been first uh, ascertained in both the private admonitions and the admonitions of, in the president presence of one or two witnesses and has remained, remained fruitless. So it's, yeah, it's describing what you just, what you just mentioned. Like it's yeah. don't, the elders are actually not allowed to no. engage in any discipline no. until, or even it almost seems even visit in a formal manner um, along this, this excommunication track without no. having no. first seen evidence of the congregation doing its work. And the reason for that is because there is so much talk in a congregation, so much gossip also in a congregation. Mm. And then it is so much easier to say to the elder, do you know that so-and-so is going to the bar and that he's doing that every week and, and uh, doesn't the consistency do anything about it? And my question, my question to that person would be, have you been to talk to him already? You know, and, and if not, then please don't bring that to the consistory meeting because you first have to do your work. You have to, on on a mutual discipline, you have to admonish each other. You have to admonish that brother that his lifestyle is not holy, is not uh, appropriate for a believer of Christ. So that's how the consistory has to ascertain, have you first gone to the steps of Matthew 18 and talk to that person and admonish that person, and if he uh, refuses to believe or to accept it, take a witness with you to, so that somebody else can hear you admonish that person before you bring it to the attention of the elders and they might be able to take it over in terms of discipline. Yeah, right. Yeah, so yeah, that, that well describes it. So maybe let's dig into it a bit more into that Matthew 18, um, it's verse 15 to 17, where, yeah. where Jesus describes this this process of, of going admonishing somebody yourself yeah. bringing a witness if that's not fruitful and then if that is unfruitful bringing it to the to the, mm-hmm. the elders and leadership of the church so yeah. why is this the i mean i guess we're just following jesus command but why is this the model that we've adopted and 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 why is that the right model like in terms of like the practicality of it well like i said earlier it is because we want to confine the, the sin and the sinner, and rather than bringing it out into the open, making it public. Like we distinguish between secret sins and public sin. So if there is a hidden sin that I know about you, then it would not be merciful, it would not be loving, it would not be godly if I would talk to others about it and say, oh, Tyler, uh, is such a you know uh, coveting man? He, he he's after the money. He's he's just living. He's you know go to casinos and what have you. Uh, no, I have to go to you personally and confine the sin between you and me. And if if you resist my admonition and you persist in that sin, then yeah, after three four times, I might say, "Wow, I'm talking to a brick wall. I'm going to take someone along." Uh, that will be also sympathetic and understanding and and realizing how serious it is that Tyler is living in that sin. And then that witness will indeed hear my admonition to see if it is scriptural, whether it is spiritual, whether it is merciful, uh, how I have been admonishing you. And in spite of such a proper admonition, you're still not repenting. Then 
that witness may come along another time and may also participate in that admonition. And then you say, wow, we need extra help. We need a broader attention for it. And we have to ask the elders to, to deal with you and to speak to you. So right. we confine the sin and the sinner as much as we can. That is the principle behind the steps of discipline. Also, barring from the table, mentioning without a name, that protects the sinner so that he is able to repent without being exposed as the bad guy to everybody. Hmm. Yeah, that makes good sense. I mean, that's definitely that's definitely a gracious and loving way to to do that, and and also patient, I guess. Like yep. that that it's been going a while. Um, yeah, following that, you know, the patience of God in the Old Testament. I I keep I keep thinking about that after you mentioned that. It's a it's a great example. Like and the Lord Jesus, there's, of there's course, prophet after prophet after prophet yeah. before the destruction comes, and yeah. that, you know, if you if you just send the you send the destruction you know, the elders down to, you know, turn the keys. It's, uh, yeah, that's not, that's not loving and not, not really no, no, no. helping correct, I guess. No, and it's also not understanding spiritually how difficult it is to repent. Mm. I think, you know, that's something that people don't realize. You know, if, if I am sitting on something and I'm being admonished for something, it takes, it takes a long time to not only admit it, but also to make changes. And, and, you know, knowing that about yourself, how hard it is to make those changes and to admit you're wrong, that's make makes you considerate when you talk to others. Right, yeah. And that's how Galatians 1 and 6, verse 1 and 2 speak about it. You who are spiritual, speak to your brother or sister in a spiritual way. Hmm. Yeah. So how you mentioned that it's it's different for private and public sins. What what's yeah. the difference then? Like, well, if if it is a sin, let's say uh, that that is public, that everybody knows uh, about, or that uh, you know that is made public because of the nature of the sin, let's say for sexual abuse, for instance, and someone is uh, caught in that practice, and, and it becomes a matter of the paper. Uh, I've I've been in, involved once in a case of someone who had stolen uh, the roof of a garage because he needed a roof for his own garage. And, you know, that was in the local paper, a nice uh, uh, little village local paper. And his name was there too. So that was a public sin of theft. So right. then it was also in the congregation. And you don't go Matthew 18 anymore, but then you are publicly exposed. And it's interesting if you read Matthew 18, and you see the passage that comes after that, that is the passage of the man who owed his uh, king a lot of money and that was had forgiven him. And then he goes to some uh, fellow servant uh, who owes him a little bit of money and he puts him in jail. Then it right away becomes known to the king and to everybody else how terrible it is what that guy had done. So Matthew 18 is important for hidden and secret sins, but also for public sins. Right. Oh, yeah, that is, yeah, that's true. So then is it, yeah, I guess you can't deal with that in the same way, obviously. No, um, no. And if there's no repentance, is that is that process similar still? Or or the elders, the elders kind of get involved right away? Yeah, then the elders get involved right away. And then the process indeed is shortened because then the name will be, announced immediately that is the second last step once the name is up, uh, is mentioned you give them another couple of weeks for uh, yeah repenting for admitting for confessing and if they don't confess and admit and repent then they are excommunicated in a much shorter process right and even there you know i have visited in jail to bring someone to repentance. And then you come with the gospel. You come with uh, the fact that Christ died for sinners, you know, and that there needs to be true, sincere sin. Like Paul speaks about in 2 Corinthians 7, and there is worldly repentance and there is godly repentance. Worldly repentance, that is, you know, if you got uh, into trouble and you end up in jail, then it's easy to say, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, because everybody knows that you did it, and, and 
I'm sorry for it. And, and that seems to be your repentance then, but it does not change your heart. While godly repentance leads to humbleness, leads to confession, to admission. So right. there is a big difference there between, you know, uh, also regarding a public sin. If there is repentance, then it does not need to re- lead to excommunication. But at the same time, the name has been mentioned. Is there a difference in the... Um... Yeah, I, I think the church order speaks of it too, like the repentance, but also it's it's not just the, you know, repenting, saying that you repent. It's also showing that you repent. Exactly. Is that, is that a bit different too for, um, I mean, obviously the the private sin may be that the witnesses in, or the, the person who's, who's, you know, helping <laughs> with the discipline or the elders even see mm-hmm. the change. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that different for a public no, uh, that, would be, that well. would be the same than before, let's say, you would readmit a person like that to the uh, Lord's Supper. Uh, that would take a while. Uh, that right. Indeed, it has to be shown. Well, first of all, you have to go through the court case sometimes. And after he is uh, released, you know, and, and back to the regular flow of life, then he has to show that he's a different man. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, make, that makes sense. It's a... It's, uh... Yeah, I mean, obviously, every situation is is different, yeah. and, and just just understanding these the, the concepts around this is really helpful because it it's not about a, a about knowing the rules for this case no. or that case. It's about knowing how to apply biblical discipline and, and biblical you know teachings uh, to it's, all, it's all it's the a, cases. It's applying the care and compassion and the love and the forgiveness of God. Mm. That's what should fill the hearts of every minister and elder dealing with church discipline, that he comes there with the Spirit of God in the love of Jesus Christ, and therefore it is not a negative thing. It's such a positive thing, because you are seeking the salvation of the sinner, and salvation not in the narrow meaning of the forgiveness of his sins, but in the renewal of his life. And because that, that new life is so rich, that new life is so so meaningful, and it is so uh, such a relief for a person who is restored to God, who is restored in the kingdom of Christ. You know, there is no more beautiful life than that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's parables about that too. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's a pearl. You find a pearl of mm-hmm. great uh, value. Yep. It's celebrating over the 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 sheep that's found, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So, so one other topic surrounding discipline is is withdrawal, and that is uh, it's been one that I've had a lot of discussions with people. But we've actually talked about it on the podcast a couple of times with different people, um, yeah. about the church order and things like that. Um, it, but it really relates to to church discipline and how we think about excommunication. We think about about these issues. Um, we also have something called withdrawal, which doesn't really show up anywhere. No. Um, so. But there's a couple um, things that I hear or I, I've, I've heard in the past um, that kind of relate. So, well, Belgian Confession 20, uh, Article 29, when it's speaking of the Marxist true church, which is kind of this series thing that we're doing, um, it says, of the Marx of the true church, it says, hereby the true church can certainly be known and no one has the right to separate from it. Um, which is yeah, it's it's one thing, and then I've also heard people express something like, "Well, of somebody who's thinking of leaving the church or has left the church, saying something like, well, it's not really your church to leave; it's it's Christ, it's the body of Christ, and and you don't get to really decide whether you're a member or not." Um, is there is there error in any like? I mean, I'm sure you'll be hesitant to say there's error in the Belgian Confession, but is mm-hmm. there? Like, what's the understanding there? Like, it's, when it's, we with, yeah. withdraw from the church, is it, do you the have the right is, to withdraw? The error is in the way you articulated it. That's they, what I want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As if, you know, they are members of the church. And the church is a church at a local address where they ought to be living members of that church, where they ought to employ themselves in the communion of the congregation. So, you are talking about church membership, and that church membership is voluntary. Someone 
submits himself under the supervision and discipline of the consistory. Then if the consistory is in the process of disciplining a person, and that person withdraws, then of course that ends the work that the office bearers can do on behalf of Christ, because he is no longer a member of that local church in which the office bearers have the authority of Christ. They don't have authority outside of the Church of Christ. So if someone withdraws himself, then you know he may withdraw himself from this local church and from this local church's process of discipline, but he cannot withdraw himself from the judgment of God. He cannot withdraw himself from what the elders were doing with him in calling him to repentance because they did so on behalf of Christ. They did so because God has shown that to be a sin that the person was doing. And he may think that he is relieved from the process of discipline, but he is not, because God still sees that person and still deals with that person. You know, and then, you know, if he would join another church, then you would hope that the other church will inquire about this person's background about this person's reason for leaving. Uh, they would inquire, what, what brings you here? Well, I was under discipline in that church, uh, or I didn't like it anymore in that church because they were getting nasty at me. Then a good Reformed church where he wants to go to should first inquire before they admit him, and if they find out about this process of discipline, then they should also process the discipline with him. Right. So withdrawal may seem like an escape route for people who don't like to be under discipline, but it is not an escape route. You cannot escape from God, and you cannot escape from another church where you may join. Although sometimes people don't have that church discipline. There are churches that don't care about this church discipline. They feel that it is uh, high-handed, or that they feel that it is a, a wrong concept, or that it should not be practiced. People should be free to live the way they like. Well, that's not a very faithful church. And then, yeah, you may you may think that you're fine and dandy by still going to church, but that's not. You cannot escape the judgment of God. Right. Yeah, that's that is helpful. So, is it is it like when someone withdraws? Yeah, we often think. Well, my mind often goes to, well, that's an escape route, right? Like yeah, what you mentioned, yeah. it's just, it's like, oh, okay, well, that's kind of a, a, a way of not having your name right off the pulpit. And, yeah. and, and to me, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, withdraw, if somebody has the mind to withdraw uh, during the process of church discipline, <clears throat> in a way they're, they're kind of acknowledging that the church discipline is, is important because if your name's read off a pulpit somewhere where you don't intend to go ever again, what do you care? But in, if you are willing, you want to withdraw from that church so that your name's not read off, mm -hmm. there's almost an element of shame or, or admitting that the church discipline was something that needed to be done, yeah, which is, is kind of, it's kind of interesting, but then can we, like, how do we think about the keys of the kingdom in that in that case? So, like, passages like um, when Jesus commands the disciples or apostles, I guess, it, it, to to spread the word through the world. But when they experience a town that's not receptive to the word, to shake the dust off their feet. Like, mm -hmm. how do these? Yeah, or even even the even the the passage of like treating an unbeliever as you would a tax collector. Like, do we? Is is with is withdraw a way of of them exercising the keys of kingdom on themselves? I mean, obviously that's not how we understand the keys of the kingdom, no, as if they no, can no. exercise it. But like, is that an implication or, or like or is that implied in that in that um announcement? Mm -hmm. Or can we not even understand the the keys of the kingdom connected to that because they've withdrawn and there's no longer jurisdiction there? Uh, you know, it, it, it is indeed a withdrawing yourself from the use of the king, keys of the kingdom, withdrawing yourself from the positive purpose of the keys of the kingdom. 
right? If you see church discipline as a positive thing and you withdraw yourself from it, you deprive yourself of the forgiveness of sins. You deprive yourselves of the mercy of God. You know, mm. so you are putting yourself into a position that is very dangerous. And yeah, at the same time, the elders can no longer exercise that uh, authority of the keys of the kingdom. Although I have to add, you know, that there are churches where they do continue to exercise that authority. Uh, and, and, and they do, let's say, continue the process, even if a person has withdrawn, and they will excommunicate him, ultimately. And, you know, I can also appreciate the meaning of that, because the meaning of withdrawal is, in a way, excommunicating yourself. Mm-hmm. But you, person, don't have the, you don't have the power to do that. You're not the leader no, of the church. I know, so I know. of course. So it is uh, a way of saying. It's a way of yeah. seeing it that way. But it is indeed uh, another symptom of someone who is ignorant, who is foolish, who does not know God or the way he works in his mercy and grace for that person. And they take the right, they take the decision in their own hands, and they think that they have the right to do that. But they are shortchanging themselves. They are not really uh, a blessing to themselves because Mm -hmm. the blessing of church discipline is repentance and return and restoration and communion. Right. So is that, is it wrong then to excommunicate somebody who's withdrawn? Or is that, is that more implying, like, does that lead us down the path of thinking that the keys of the kingdom is us exercising like salvation on the, on the person is like, or taking that control on ourselves that um, like as no, you, uh, if you're leaders in the church. It's in a way of saying that, of course, you cannot do that yourself, but implicitly, in principle, right. you are indeed putting yourself outside of the communion of the saints, first of all, but yeah, also because there was the process of discipline, you're setting yourself also outside of the communion with God. Right. Outside <laughs> of that, the kingdom. Oh. So to ex to excommunicate somebody who has withdrawn, is that too much like the Roman Catholic Church where they believe that it is them? Like it's their decision, basically? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly not personally in favor of continuing that process after withdrawal. Because, like I say, church membership is voluntary, and if someone withdraws, that ends the authority of the consistory. But I can I can understand that the principle of withdrawal is, in a way, excommunication. So if there are churches that excommunicate, do that on the basis of that principle. Right. And, and you know, right or wrong, or true or not, uh, what the person is doing who withdraws himself is as cert- as as serious as excommunication. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, well, okay, kind of two questions. Maybe first, the it's a bit of a muddy water. So we have church re- like sister church relations with a lot of other churches. Sometimes we don't, and the member withdraws to go to another church that we may admit is not as as faithful of a church, if I could say that. Um, yeah. Although I think we had Clarence Bauman on, and, and he would push back saying that if it's not a true church, it's a false church. But if it's um, if it's somewhere like like say leave the Canadian Reformed Church and go to a Christian Reformed Church, we don't believe that they are right on on many things. Um, mm-hmm. Do do we take that in consideration when we make that announcement of withdrawal? Because I've I've heard some pretty gracious. I think that's probably a good way to put it. Great, gracious withdraw announcements. Yeah. Um, although I've heard some not so gracious, you know, mm-hmm. announcements that seem as if they're near nearer to an excommunication announcement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe just in tone and not in the words used, but um, yeah, how can we navigate that? Yeah, I can, I can appreciate the developments of let's say the last twenty years in looking at those announcements and being more gracious or being more careful in pronouncing judgment over that person or pronouncing that that person has withdrawn himself from uh, the church or from the church of Jesus Christ. 
No, he, he withdraws himself from the Church of Christ at this place. Right. That is already a more correct and a more gracious way of saying it. Because I don't believe that we need to judge where he's going or what he's doing. Uh, that's none of my business. We are only called to be uh, authority in this church over the things that happen in this church. And if he withdraws from his local church, that's all I need to announce. And right. then, you know, whether he goes to a CRC or a URC or whatever he's got to do, uh, yeah, that is none of my business. And that's not the business of the Kozitsky either, to judge whether that's a good choice or not, or whether that uh, remedies the situation or not. No, uh, then we have to leave it to that other church to see whether they are going to inquire or not. Right. And if, the, if they don't inquire, well, that's beyond our authority and ability. But right. the announcement indeed needs to be done very carefully, just as the whole process of discipline should be done very carefully. Like we are as office bearers, and I sincerely mean that, we are doing our work with fear and trembling mm -hmm. because we are God's instruments. We are doing work here on earth on behalf of Christ, and it better be in the spirit of Christ. So the fact that the churches have become more careful in those kind of announcements, I think, is also the mercy of Christ. That's right. not a, yeah. a slackening or a, a slippery slope or something. No, that is just to think about that announcement and our position in it. And then right. being more careful and more gracious, I think, is more in the spirit of Christ than to declare that person more, more or less lost or, or to declare that person or go to a false church or something. No, that, that's right. irrelevant. We're right. only dealing with our congregation. Yeah. Hmm. So that kind of leads me to my second question. Where does that leave us as, as members? So when I hear an announcement of withdrawal, am I as a member supposed to take that as, as the consistory, you know, saying, okay, let's, let's treat them as an unbeliever like that, that passage or like, Obviously, like the, if the if the elder's responsibility ends with with trying to admonish this person to bring them back, does it also end with the congregation? What what sort of responsibility should we we have there, and or should we treat them as an unbeliever in that we should still be trying to reach out to them and convert them? Yeah, I say the latter. You know, the official status is he has withdrawn himself, but if you know that person. If you perhaps have a relationship with a person, or if he belongs to your family, it could happen. You know, you continue to speak to that person and, and maintain that relationship and, and call him back, call him to repentance, show him the error of his way. Okay? So you don't break that relationship, unless, of course, he becomes hostile, he declares you a bunch of hypocrites like this happened, you know, and he, and he becomes uh, arrogant about... You people who are in the church thinks that you are holy and righteous and what have you, and they declare me as a sinner. You know, if you have that kind of attitude, then, yeah, you may admonish him once or twice, but then you say, well, uh, go your way uh, if you think that that's the right way, and I cannot do any further with you. Mm. And so it depends on that attitude. And that applies also to someone who is excommunicated. You treat them as a Gentile and tax collector, which means you treat them the way I treat all my neighbors here in the neighborhood. They, whenever I have an opportunity, I evangelize. I speak to them about faith, about Christ, about God, about, you know, whatever uh, is the point of discussion. I share with them what I believe and where the way of salvation is. So a Gentile and a tax collector, the Lord Jesus called tax collectors to repentance. He called, you know, Zacchaeus uh, to open his house for him. So we don't just break off all contact and say, oh, it is a Gentile, and I have no nothing to do with him. Of course, we have to live in this world. We have to deal with the people in this world. We have to share the gospel in this world. So uh, if someone is excommunicated, I would still evangelize that person. But I would not go out for coffee with him, or I would not uh, invite him over as a friend, or have a beer with him in the backyard. No, there is a difference. I only have that with brothers and sisters in the Lord. 
then I have a relationship, a friendship, a spiritual uh, connection with that person. Uh, but they should not get the feeling as if it doesn't matter anyway when you are excommunicated. Right. They, should, they should really feel that being excommunicated makes them a Gentile and a tax collector, makes them a person who needs to be shunned or who needs to be avoided in terms of friendship and relationships. Right. And that makes sense with if you think about uh, punishment or discipline in a family too, right? Like, yeah, we don't even even your little kid. You have you know, you're not eating with the family tonight. It's like, well, but when you repent, then you can come eat with the family again. Like, you're not, uh, yeah, you're not part of it. You're not part of if if you just get treated the same regardless. You're not not going to learn anything, I guess. Yeah. yeah, but at the same time, you know, you do evangelize. Yeah. And, and you do incorrect, share yeah. the riches of the gospel from which they have deprived themselves. Right. Yeah. So how do we, it's tough from a, a, a member standpoint, but also as, as an elder or leader in the church, how do we square things like um, the keys of the kingdom, loosing on earth, or being loosed in heaven um, passages with something like judge, lest not you be judged or something like like there, there is an element also in in scripture of of let's not pass judgment on one another. That's right. Um, yeah. How do we square those? Because that's, I mean, it kind of gets into our cultural moment too. Like people yeah. are like, don't judge me. You do bad things too. You spoke to the, somebody who who may say like, well, you're a bunch of hypocrites. You're all evil too. Um, of course, we know that as a church and as members in a church um, that we that we sin and we're not perfect. Um, how do we? understand that and navigate that in a conversation with somebody who's yeah so on the one hand we do have to judge we do have to judge whether something is godly or not whether something is obedient or righteous or not whether something is sinful or not we do have to judge and we have to test the spirits and we have to avoid evil so we are in need called to judge but when the lord jesus speaks about do not judge then he is talking about, you know, yeah, uh, a weakness in somebody else, a, a weakness, uh, let's say, someone who is struggling with uh, being patient, someone who is struggling with uh, being kind, someone who is struggling, and, and you say, oh, you are impatient, uh, not, uh, and, you know, that is looking at the beam in somebody else's eye, without realizing that you yourself have your own struggles with different things. So that's what the Lord Jesus is really focusing on, and that you don't become a judge of others who have weaknesses and sins or, or that they are struggling with, and that they are aware of, and that, you know, uh, they know that they are repenting from. And that, you know, that could be a process of repentance as well. So the Lord Jesus is talking about judging each other regarding weaknesses of faith, weaknesses in, in sins. Whereas, you know, we are called to judge, according to Matthew 18, when something is sinful, when something is sinned against me, okay? when someone has blatantly lied to me, and I can expose that lie, then I have to judge that as a lie. Mm. Okay? So it, it is a different scenario, it's a different type of setting, when you talk about judging each other in a sense of haughtiness, of, of arrogance, of looking down upon somebody else while you don't realize how sinful you are yourself. Right. Yeah, that yeah, I guess the, yeah, there's a there is a difference there and, and total difference. Yeah. Yeah. And to our so I guess that speaks to our cultural moment too. So I guess I've been I've been wanting to talk about this for a long time, this this church discipline. I, I just see the culture pushing, more tolerant. I mean, we've been seeing this for years. I'm probably mm -hmm. not, you know, this isn't new to my lifetime. No. Um, but, well, first of all, is that coming into the church? And, and second of all, like, how do we deal with that when it does, like, inevitably mm -hmm. make its way, you know, into our minds, even, even in subtle ways? Like, how do we keep this church discipline, something that's pure and holy and loving without becoming tolerant or or accepting and and bringing this cultural milieu into our our church 
Yeah, that is indeed a challenge of our time, uh, that we, in the first place, as believers, are not as open for admonition as we should be. You know, where, which means that we are not as honest about our sinfulness, honest about our weaknesses and shortcomings as we should be. And if, you know, if, if in the church people can no longer admonish each other, then that is already the beginning of the, yeah, the di disappearance of discipline. If, there, if, if mutual discipline does not work anymore, which could also be the result of self-discipline not being functioned anymore. If, if we feel that we are fine the way we are, and the minister can preach the way he wants, and we take his sermons for information, but don't really interact with it, don't really ponder it in the week after, and examine ourselves, you know, if, if our self-examination before the Lord's Supper is non-functioning then and non-existent, yeah, then we are already in the same process that we are influenced by the culture in which we live. But because the culture is, do as you please, live as you like. Uh, people are selfish, self-centered. Uh, people are superficial. If the church people become superficial and self-centered, and, and uh, uh, avoiding admonition, and, and not really conscious of their own weakness and sinfulness, yeah, then we are in the process of having discipline disappear, which is something that has happened to other denominations before. So it's definitely something that we should be vigilant about, and that also the preaching should address. Okay? The preaching has to be a two-edged sharp sword. It's mm -hmm. proclaimed for faith and repentance. Now, if that preaching is watered down into a salvation story, into a salvation message, without a call to repentance, without exposing people's sins, then from the preaching already, you have the process of discipline disappearing, because right. people are no longer in the habit of interacting with the preaching, because they are fine, as long as I'm saved, as long as I'm forgiven. As long as the Lord loves me and I love the Lord, then that should be fine. So that's where it starts. The preaching should be decisive in regards to calling to faith and repentance. Mm. That should yeah. be followed up also with care for each other, where we dare to talk together about our lifestyle, about practices in the church that are not pleasing to the Lord, and from which people will have to change, have to repent. You know, so yeah, that's that's really a process, and the influence of our is definitely a, a danger that we uh, that is relevant that we have to be aware of very much. Yeah, you know, that needs yeah. to be exposed in the preaching yeah, that this is the kind of culture we live in a culture of death, a culture without norms or values, a culture in which people don't need to change because uh, I'm fine the way it is, and if you don't like me then uh, you can, uh, you know, shut up. And if, if that is the whole mentality of our time, then the church needs to be extra vigilant to say, but that may not become the culture in the church. That may not be the atmosphere in our congregation. We mm. need to desire to be holy because God is holy. So the holiness, the godliness of the church depends on the holiness and godliness of the member. Mm. Yeah, that's actually, that's a really good insight, because that's right away my my thoughts, well, my thoughts often tend to the, yeah, more, like, they tend to the government and the church leaders and, and these, the, the authorities to take care of this, but it's not really always that, like, it's not always church discipline that's that's lacking from a leader's perspective, no. that we're not, you know, say, hard-handed enough in in dealing with sin. It's also right. the hearts of the members, mm -hmm. even like what you said, like interacting with the preaching, yes. thinking about a self-discipline every week to, to to internalize those sermons and to really understand the scriptures and yes. and to understand even understanding what's right and wrong, like what is sin, um, is is it is a precursor to the whole church discipline thing. Exactly. If we don't if we don't get there before, you know, the leader, the church leaders don't have a chance i guess because no. we're not doing our portion of uh of christian discipline so yeah that's and that's why for instance uh yeah mutual discipline should really be foremost in the minds of people and i think you know participating 
in a, a small group setting or in a, a sort of Bible study society setting where you can speak about the scriptures and then also be practical and personal in, in admitting or confessing what is not right. And that way, you know, in a way, admonish each other uh, indirectly or implicitly. And you don't have to, you know, lift up your finger and, and, and start teaching a person how bad he is. No, that, that could come out in the in the way we communicate with each other at a meeting. Right, yeah. Yeah. So it was very natural, very spiritual, the way we speak with each other and deal with each other. Mm. And I guess that's a good part of it to create spaces where that happens yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we can all do better, I guess, in, in doing that every day in our lives instead of, you know, always, you know, having a beer over chatting about sports, but, you know, to yeah. speak about our faith more often mm-hmm. and more, you know, more regularly, more freely, I guess. Well, so, wow, this has been, uh, this has been quite the, uh, well, definitely learning experience for me, like understanding some of these things in, in a different light is, is definitely good. I mean, obviously I've asked you questions. You'd be like, don't ask it like that. <laughs> no, no. So you can, you can see me learning already, but That's is good. there anything you, anything you want to add before we uh, let the listeners go apply? No, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation and I think you know, all the important points have come out in the conversation and hopefully, you know, it will be watched by many people so that it has a fruitful effect on the life of people in the congregations, because this is something that we need to be reminded of all mm-hmm. the time. And as far as preaching is concerned, yeah, you cannot address that point every Sunday. And that happens only once in a while in the right context that you could mention that. Hey, you don't harp on the same string all the time, but it definitely is something that needs to be more exposed right now than let's say 15 years ago. And that's yeah. why I really hope that your podcast will be watched by many and that many will uh, yeah, examine themselves or examine their local church situation and hopefully uh, apply it and, uh, and it will improve on the local discipline in a positive, gentle, gracious, merciful way. Yeah, that, well, I really appreciate you bringing all this, uh, you know, in a biblical way to this and hopefully everyone... Uh, learns and and can can keep the conversation going with their you know their friends and and family and you know let this let this topic kind of permeate through yeah. through our lives so i really appreciate the time yeah. Reverend, and uh and uh yeah thanks for coming on and for the listeners uh thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time thanks for tuning in to this episode of real talk We really appreciate you taking the time to listen or watch the show. If you want to send us your feedback, and we'd love to hear it, please email us at reformedrealtalk at gmail.com. If you want to find us online or social media, we've got a lot of great content there. Just search Reformed Real Talk and we should come right up. This show is created and produced by myself, Lucas Holtfluer, and Tyler Vanderwood. And our wonderful podcast manager who does all the editing is Mariah Tamiga. So we're really thankful for her contribution to the show as well. That's all for now, folks. Thanks for watching or listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.